In this episode of Off the Shelf, we're going to talk about environmental anthropology, how the discipline is defined, a little bit of its history and theoretical outlook, and some of the careers that you might have with the background in the field. I'm trying to tell you I'm not your enemy, I'm a scientist. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. According to Barnard and Spencer's definition, environmental anthropology focuses on the complex relations between human beings and their environments, as well as the ways in which populations can transform their environment, both intentionally and unintentionally, and the ways in which an environment can, in turn, shape a culture, informing everything from social and economic to religious and political life. In studying all of this, environmental anthropologists draw from a variety of methods, sometimes combining traditional ethnography with other qualitative and quantitative approaches from the social sciences, as well as the ecological insights provided by natural science. Environmental anthropology is also a very applied branch of anthropology. It's not uncommon to find environmental anthropologists working outside of the academy, as, for example, advocates for indigenous rights organizations, as cultural intermediaries between environmental activists and governmental organizations, or even as policymakers with international institutions like the World Wildlife Fund. Conceived broadly, in this sense, environmental anthropology is not only a growing interdisciplinary field, but it's also a vitally important sector of research that can help to build bridges between the humanities and environmental sciences and highlight the human costs of climate change, as well as the adaptability of our species and its historical relationship with the ecosystems of which we are all a part. But when we say environmental anthropology, what do we mean specifically by the environment? Well, it's common for disciplinary theorists to divide the environment into a number of different spheres, each with distinct research methods and specialist terminology. Catton and Dunlap, for example, define the environment by dividing it into these four categories. As these relate to the social sciences, one of environmental anthropology's major contributions is that it doesn't define the environment as something external to human beings or separate from or opposed to culture and society. Influential publications like Gregory Bateson's Steps to an Ecology of Mind and William Bailey's Footprints of the Forest, to pick two from a very long list, pave the way for many researchers to reject the motif of nature versus civilization, which is central to so much modernist literature and still erroneously informs common economic and political discourses today. Drawing from criteria like Catton and Dunlap's taxonomy, environmental anthropology emphasizes the interpenetration and mutual adaptation of biological built and social environments, arguing that the environment is not just influenced by humans in a material sense, but is always seen and understood through the lens of a given culture. If you look it up online, you'll find a considerable amount of overlap between environmental anthropology and a number of related fields, in particular ecological anthropology. For the purposes of this video, I'm following Konina and Shorman Wiemey and using the two terms interchangeably, but there is a somewhat contentious and evolving discourse regarding how and where to draw the line between environmental and ecological anthropology, which I'll discuss briefly in the video description below. For our purposes, what's important to remember is that the term environmental anthropology really only gained popularity in the 1990s, and as it's used today represents the product of over a century of multi-method interdisciplinary research and cross-fertilization. The field originally grew out of cultural ecology, which was established in part by the anthropologist Julian Stewart in the 1950s and 60s. In books like Theory of Culture Change, for example, Stewart was one of the first social scientists to emphasize the role played by ecological factors in the evolution of a culture. As they developed over the second half of the 20th century, environmental or ecological anthropologists combined aspects of cultural ecology with theories and methods from a variety of disciplines, including ethnobiology, political ecology, and historical ecology. And the result was a new and innovative field that encompassed multiple qualitative approaches to studying human-environment interactions, supplemented by quantitative and natural scientific research methods, all within a broader ecological context. If you're a student interested in studying environmental anthropology, one of the first things you may notice in looking for departments is the highly interdisciplinary nature of the field, which gives programs a discernibly different, more multi-method approach from social and cultural anthropology. One of the best graduate examples I can think of is the Combined School of the Environment and Anthropology program at Yale University in the United States. 
The combined YSC anthropology program blends the methodological, natural scientific strengths of environmental studies with the theoretical and qualitative background of anthropology, giving students insight into both anthropocentric and ecocentric perspectives, again, emphasizing the interpenetration and mutual adaptation of nature and culture. This allows students to represent themselves as anthropologists or environmental scientists, as theoreticians or practitioners, as well as giving them the credentials to apply for policy positions with international institutions, which raises the question, what can you actually do with a degree in environmental anthropology? Well, the field opens up a huge number of possibilities. There are, of course, academic careers in research and teaching, but very few anthropological subdisciplines have as many opportunities outside of the academy. You'll find environmental anthropologists in government careers, working with federal agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Park Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. There are also possibilities with a number of environmental activist groups, as well as international organizations like the United Nations, the Red Cross, or the Agency for International Development. And finally, there are curation careers, principally working as curators for museums, historical sites, and wildlife preserves, doing outreach and raising public awareness regarding historical conservation and environmental protection. And that's just what I came up with in writing this episode. The interdisciplinary nature of the field opens up a huge number of possibilities, with your subspecialization, interests within the field, and respective level of education determining the types of positions that might be available to you after you receive your degree. If you found that helpful, please do like and subscribe. It'll help us make more videos on social scientific subjects that might be of interest to you or people like you. And if you're interested in environmental anthropology specifically, I'll put a few links to solid programs that I'm familiar with in the video description. And until next time, don't ever stop learning. <laughs>